Corrosion Part 4. Hello everyone, this is Corrosion Lecture 4, Kinetics of Electrochemical Corrosion, uh, in which we will obtain some equations for predicting how fast active electrochemical corrosion happens, and that is something we will be able to do uh, once we have first of all identified what kind of observable things uh, can be used to quantify the speed of corrosion. By way of introduction to observing or measuring corrosion, I found these pictures on the internet. Uh, they are part of a video filmed by someone who was on an airplane flight when the passengers in front of him discovered what appeared to be an ominous crack growing in the wall of the cabin. So, naturally, this excited a great deal of interest, and various people came to observe the new feature of the airplane. Uh, first, a flight attendant, and uh, then some other bloke, uh, maybe one of the pilots. Anyway, uh, the captain here on this plane turned the plane around and landed fine. But what strikes me most about these videos is how interested the people seem to be in the very exciting task of observing possible corrosion of the airplane wall. So these passengers here uh, seem to have various different levels of enthusiasm uh, for learning about the possible corrosion problem. Um, but this gentleman uh, looks absolutely delighted uh, to be on a plane with a, a real-life corrosion phenomenon. So you can take away from this clip that observing corrosion is really very interesting indeed. Uh, but you could also take away that it's quite important. Uh, we need to learn, know how we can learn properly from signs of corrosion. After all, um, on this plane, uh, they erred uh, well on the side of caution, and, and they were fine. Uh, but on this other picture, uh, this is from 1988, this Aloha Airlines Flight uh, 243 picture is precisely one of the reasons why on the uh, more modern video uh, the, uh, they needed to be cautious. Uh, this shows the Aloha Airline plane after it landed, which luckily it was still able to do, uh, even though most of the hull around the front third of the passenger cabin had uh, cracked off in mid-flight uh, due to it is thought, um, rivet fatigue uh, caused by partly expanding aluminium corrosion products, uh, which are a known corrosion hazard in aircraft, and something which uh, should have been monitored more carefully, and we say is monitored carefully uh, today. So how then is uh, corrosion measured? Uh, it depends on the application and the problem you need to worry about. Uh, this table on page 25 of the handout lists a few methods. Uh, pretty commonly, uh, corrosion speed is uh, measured experimentally with these kinds of test samples, or coupons, uh, which are left out in some relevant environment, like on a, a beautiful beachfront setting, uh, for some period of time, maybe years. Then the Samples are cleaned off, weighed to see how much metal is left, and uh, it's possible then to plot a few different units for rate of corrosion. Uh, one thing is that you can find out uh, grams uh, of metal lost or percentage of mass lost from the coupon per year, uh, but that is not normally very useful at all because it would only be a meaningful number for describing what happens to identical objects. Uh, more usefully, as a general measurement of corrosion, the mass loss measurement in uh, grams uh, per year for the coupon is uh, converted, uh, divided through by the area of the coupon, its surface area, to find out how many uh, micrometers or millimeters per year of the metal uh, is lost as its surface recedes inwards under the, the ravages of the elements. So microns per year, or millimetres per year, uh, are a, a pretty understandable unit in everyday language for measuring the speed of corrosion, so that's one that you need to be able to work with. But uh, in electrochemistry algebra, uh, it's also it's, it's actually important to work in terms of corrosion current density in units like uh, amps per metre squared. So you need to be able to convert between that and millimetres per year, uh, which is done using the Faraday equation, uh, which is coming up uh, pretty shortly. 
So before we get to that, um, those are the two most important measurements for corrosion speed in general, uh, but there are a few more important units for the amount of corrosion uh, which you might need to be able to look up in some sort of table uh, for more specialist situations. One specialist corrosion situation is called pitting corrosion. So you can see pitting corrosion in these pictures of stainless steel alloys that have been exposed to a very aggressive mixture of sulfuric and hydrochloric acid at uh, something over 100 degrees Celsius. Now, the problem we see here is that the metal surface becomes uh, pitted. Um, if this was wood, you would say it looked like it was worm-eaten, uh, but actually it's metal, and uh, some other process causes this. We'll come back to look at the exact process in the chapter on localised corrosion phenomenon. Um, but the result is that we get this surface, and the pitting corrosion cannot just be described by a uniform thickness of metal being lost um, in terms of millimetre per year over the whole surface, uh, because actually none of these metal samples are losing much material uniformly, uh, but some of them do nonetheless have a very serious problem uh, because they are covered in these uh, so-called pits where the corrosion of the metal by dissolution is concentrated into small areas, and those areas have quite deep holes, which could easily be catastrophic, for example by allowing a pressure vessel or a pipeline to leak. So, if we need to worry about predicting the extent of pitting corrosion, uh, we would need to look up uh, some experimental results, which could tell us, for example, how many pits per metre square are found on a test sample after some exposure to a particular environment for some time, or after this treatment we could find what is the average or maximum pit depth found on a test sample. In practice, you might also need to measure pit depth on some piece of metal in surface, uh, because the, the real environment there uh, may not be accurately enough predicted by some kind of experimental model. Uh, okay, other other specialist situations exist too. Uh, there are lots, so let's just list a couple. Uh, we could think about depletion depth in an alloy, uh, in which one metal element, probably the more reactive one in the metal, uh, might be lost from some surface layer down to a particular depletion depth. Uh, this could weaken the object. And because of this, um, or because of oxide growth on the surface, we could talk about a decrease in fracture toughness of some alloy. Um, and in a specialist situation like that, uh, we would need tables of experimental results about how a given alloy, uh, its properties deteriorate under some particular environment. Okay, but in this chapter, in the rest of this chapter, I want to look at predicting speed of corrosion uh, based on the uh, idea of uniform corrosion and we'll use a quite widely applicable algebraic theory of corrosion kinetics uh, in which we'll be talking about corrosion as a, a simple uniform dissolution process and it will have a speed measured in millimeters per year or amps per meter squared. Okay, on page 26 we start with a statement in section 3.1.1 which introduces the algebraic symbol small i, used for describing current density. Current density is used in electrochemistry to quantify the speed at which some electrochemical process happens in terms in units of amps per meter squared. Let's just recall one of the reasons why current density is used in electrochemistry, which is that electronic current density is usually very easy to measure, uh, and also, it's not hard to translate it into corrosion speed in the more intuitive engineering terms of millimetres per year. We can do that translation using the Faraday relation in section 3.2. Uh, in this section 3.2, uh, we imagine this picture. We have a block of dissolving metal M, and we write down how the rate at which the metal anode dissolves into metal ions with charge Z+, plus is related to the net electronic current in amps, uh, which is written in algebra as capital I. 
uh, one mole of metal M uh, reacts and dissolves and it gives out uh, Z moles of electrons with uh, a total charge ZF. Uh, so if the net charge uh, is Q, uh, Q describes the amount of charge passing through an electrochemical cell when N moles of this metal dissolve, clearly equation 3.1 is true. Uh, when, it, when it says that the charge is the number of moles of metal which dissolve times by the charge released per mole of metal, or Q is equal to ZFN. Now, the electric current is the rate of flow of charge, so uh, we can just differentiate equation 3.1 to get equation 3.2, uh, in which the total electric current I is given by uh, ZF dN by dt. ZF is a constant for the given chemistry, so we're just uh, differentiating the um, number of moles N which have dissolved to get this uh, molar rate of dissolution dN by dt. Uh, we can say that the uh, net corrosion current density, then, is this small term I, small i, in equation 3.3. It's just the uh, current per unit surface area of the dissolving block, uh, as shown in the picture. Now, since the metal here is dissolving, uh, it's an anode, and we conventionally say that current density for an anode is positive. Uh, so like plus uh, 3 milliamps per centimeter squared, for example. Um, for a cathode process, uh, like electroplating, then we conventionally say the current density is negative. Uh, sometimes, uh, for clarity, I will write down these algebraic terms with absolute value notation given by the uh, vertical lines. Uh, this is to make it clear that sometimes we might need to subtract one term from the other to find out the difference. Uh, in other words, to find out is there a net current density affecting a metal surface. Uh, now at this point, uh, I want to point out that this relation in equation 3.3, which des it describes the net current density of electrons flowing out of the metal anode. So this is an important thing to note because in electrochemistry many metal dissolution processes and similar processes are actually imagined as reversible things uh, in which there is simultaneously a forwards and a backwards process going on at the same time. And the net rate of dissolution of a metal uh, is the difference between the forwards and the backwards rates. So an example of this is shown in equation 3.5. Uh, this says we imagine we have a copper metal surface uh, which is dissolving with some net rate uh, described as the current density I subscript net uh, for the uh, copper electrode in electrode notation. But uh, the environment in this case is only just causing active dissolution, active corrosion of the copper. And so this net dissolution is happening close to a dynamic in equilibrium. Uh, that means the net metal dissolution rate is equal to the forwards anodic dissolution current density, labelled I subscript A, uh, minus the value of the uh, slower, but still happening, reverse cathodic process described I subscript C for its current density. Um, the cathodic uh, current density represents a small amount of electroplating happening simultaneously to a large amount of the metal dissolving. So we'll need this idea of dynamic equilibrium in section 3.5 when we invent an algebraic model for electrochemical kinetics. Uh, for now, uh, let's go back to thinking about net corrosion current density. Uh, in this example, 3.2.1, uh, where Faraday's law of equation 3.3 is used to relate the net corrosion current density and the corrosion speed of the metal in millimetres per year. Okay. The example is this. Uh, calculate the net current density equivalent to the steady rate dissolution of one millimetre per year of steel. Uh, assume the reaction is uh, iron, uh, Fe, metal, uh, goes to uh, Fe2 plus dissolved ions, releasing two electrons. Uh, we have some data, the density of metallic iron and the atomic weight of iron. 
and we can uh, draw a picture for this uh, situation, this dissolving block, and we can write down uh, equation A, uh, the Faraday law from equation 3.3, .3, uh, which says this current density I uh, is Zf over A uh, times the molar reaction rate uh, dN by dT. Uh, from the picture for this uh, situation, we can write down equation B, saying the number of moles of metal that have dissolved are the uh, equal to the volume dissolved times the density divided by the atomic weight, and the volume dissolved is the surface area of the metal times by the depth lost, and the depth lost is the corrosion speed times time, uh, U, the corrosion speed, times the time interval dt. So uh, substituting equation B into equation A, we get uh, this simple equation C for current density, uh, and we can put in values and find out the uh, current density is 0.86 amps per meter squared in this situation. Uh, that's a number worth knowing, roughly, uh, because uh, for many metals, um, a uniform corrosion speed of one millimeter per year uh, will be roughly in the order of magnitude the same corrosion current density uh, as this. Uh, so roughly uh, somewhere around one amp per meter squared. Now, in a real situation, there is not just one process making up the net current density affecting a metal surface. There is a mixture of processes, and we need a theory to describe each one of them. Uh, section 3.3 .3 on page 27 um, outlines how to do this. Um, following on from the argument describing galvanic potential on page 20, uh, the surface of a metal object has an electrical potential E, uh, which happens to be easily measurable. Uh, this surface potential E uh, can be called E subscript mixed if it is caused only by a mixture of chemicals reacting on the, the surface, or it can be called E subscript applied if the potential is applied by some external electronics, uh, for example, in a powered cathodic protection system. More on those in chapter 5. Uh, often, uh, there is a mixed surface potential on some metal which we're studying, uh, but we don't particularly care how the surface potential comes about, uh, so in that case I'll just call that surface potential E. Now, uh, this measured surface potential E might, uh, in general, be different from the equilibrium potential E subscript zero uh, of uh, one of the individual electrode reactions on the surface. Uh, indeed, uh, the surface potential E is a complexly weighted average of the uh, various equilibrium potentials present, uh, so it's actually very unlikely to be exactly equal to any one of them. Now, uh, suppose then, for example, a piece of copper in water has a surface potential E which is not equal to the equilibrium potential uh, for the copper metal to copper 2 plus ion electrode process. Uh, in that case, uh, the electrode, the piece of metal, is said to be polarized with respect to the copper to copper 2 plus electrode process. Uh, the polarization, which is called eta in algebra, is measured in volts. So, as in equation 3.6, uh, eta is E minus E subscript zero. Uh, or, uh, we could be specific about which electrode process we're measuring the polarization of uh, by adding the electrode uh, notation. So then it would be uh, eta of the copper copper 2 plus electrode is equal to E minus the E subscript zero of the copper to copper 2 plus electrode. Polarization uh, this eta uh, is the driving force for corrosion. So if we recall equation 2.57, which said that a two electrode process is thermodynamically predicted to go forwards if the reversible cell potential is positive, um, 
So that was meaning the difference of the cathode equilibrium potential minus the anode equilibrium potential. Uh, if that's positive, as shown in equation 2.57, uh, then we predict uh, that the reversible cell potential is positive and the uh, corrosion process will proceed with whatever metal is there at the anode. Um, now, when the cathode potential, the cathode is a complex environment rather than uh, just one reaction, uh, we said we imagine measuring the potential of the cathode and then we evaluate the reversible cell potential uh, as in equation 3.7a. Uh, then uh, we went on on page 20 and we argued that uh, the prediction made by equation 3.7a is the same as the prediction made by equation 3.7b which asks the slightly simpler question which is is the surface potential more positive than the possible copper anode equilibrium potential? Uh, if so, uh, then we predict uh, there is still a positive reversible cell potential and the copper corrodes. Uh, now finally, putting together this together that with equation 3.6 from this section, uh, the equation 3.7b is the same as asking if the polarization of the copper electrode is positive. So uh, that's the question we want to ask. It's equation 3.7c. Um, we're just asking, is the polarization of the copper to copper 2 plus electrode positive? If yes, uh, then uh, what do we have? The important uh, conclusions from this slide are that if the polarization of some metal electrode process is positive, uh, then the local environment will corrode that metal. Um, Second conclusion, if the polarization of the metal electrode is negative, uh, then the local environment will not corrode the metal-to-metal uh, -metal plus electrode. Uh, in fact, in that case, uh, the reversible cell potential uh, with the uh, metal, say the copper metal at the anode, if it's negative, um, in that case there's actually a driving force for the reverse process, uh, which would be, uh, for example, electroplating of the copper. So, third conclusion, if the polarization of an electrode is z of a process like copper 2 copper two plus is zero, uh, that means there is zero net driving force for either corrosion or electrode plating. In that case, thermodynamically, we uh, predict there's uh, no, pro no corrosion predicted to happen going forwards. Uh, but, in fact, electrochemical kinetics um, assumes that when you have zero net rate of corrosion, uh, when you have polarization equal to zero, uh, what we actually have is a dynamic equilibrium with equal rates of metal dissolving and plating. So uh, we can imagine the the um, in the equation that follows, we can imagine we have this uh, copper metal block, and the reason that the net corrosion current density uh, for copper to copper two plus is zero is actually because it's equal to the combination of the um, the rate at which it dissolves, this anodic current density, uh, minus the rate at which it plates out, this cathodic current density. And those are both uh, have the same value, and they're equal to this I subscript zero uh, called the exchange current density of the electrode. So that's the rate of both the forward and backward corrosion processes uh, when the electrode, the uh, copper uh, to copper 2 plus electrode is at equilibrium. Section 3.4 tells us the exchange current density uh, of some process, uh, this important I0 value, uh, can be found from experimental data. Uh, the way this will be done is that we will soon have an equation which describes what is the net current density affecting a metal surface um, as a function of the applied polarization. So then if we do a measurement where we uh, measure for various different applied polarizations the net current density, uh, we can fit the parameters of that equation and in that way we can infer uh, one of the parameters, the exchange current density of um, whatever electrode process is happening. Importantly, um, exchange current density for a process, it depends not only on the chemical transformation, for example, copper to copper 2 plus uh, is one transformation, or uh, hydrogen ions H plus uh, turning into hydrogen gas is another transformation. 
Uh, not only does it depend on that uh, process, it also depends on the surface chemistry. Uh, how catalytic is the surface this uh, electrochemical process takes place on? And this, uh, this is very important, especially for the hydrogen reaction. In Table 3.2, uh, we see the measured or inferred um, exchange current densities for the hydrogen cathode on various different metals. Uh, so we see that uh, for platinum, a good electrocatalyst, the hydrogen reaction has an extremely high exchange current density. So this is why platinum is used as a electrode in fuel cells, where we want to support, for example, the hydrogen, also the oxygen reaction, to happen as fast as possible. At the same time, looking down the table, we see iron supports uh, this reasonably high exchange current density for the hydrogen reaction of uh, 2 microamps per centimetre squares is per centimetre squared is given. And this is consistent with the fact that we know iron um, thermodynamically, we expect it to corrode in aqueous solution, and we also know that it corrodes fairly fast. That's consistent with the fact that it's quite a good catalyst for the hydrogen reaction. A bit further down the table, zinc, uh, we also know actively corrodes in aqueous solution, uh, but actually it corrodes um, slower than you might expect, uh, partly because it has a slower exchange current density for the hydrogen process. And right at the bottom of the table, lead, a notorious catalyst poison, has an extremely low exchange current density for the hydrogen reaction. Uh, so lead uh, coatings uh, will frequently corrode very slowly um, if, just, uh, if just the hydrogen reaction is available as an oxidizing agent, uh, simply because it, it's a bad catalyst for that process. So lead also, which only just actively corrodes in many situations, is um, often a good corrosion-resistant coating. And that's why you can find lead in architecture, and it basically sits there and dissolves at most very, very slowly. And in other situations, it might just get covered with a scale, and it might be essentially uh, inert or passive. Okay, so uh, we have now looked at polarization and exchange current density, and those are the two key concepts which we need to get an equation relating corrosion rate to thermodynamic driving force of corrosion and kinetic parameters. Right, so now let's go on to develop an equation for how fast does a corrosion process happen. Let's start with the simplest possible uh, model for which we need an equation describing corrosion speed. In diagram 3.4.1 we see a picture showing several steps which take place in a corrosion cell. We have, uh, we have metal dissolving uh, from an anode, we have some ion transport in solution, we have a cathode reaction, so that might be something like a hydrogen discharge with hydrogen gas being evolved, and we have electron transport between the anode site and the cathode site. Several steps uh, happen uh, at the same time in this corrosion process, and in a full equation describing the speed of corrosion, I might need to consider any one of those being rate limiting. To start with, to make a simple equation describing corrosion speed, I want to only consider one, well actually, one per electrode a thing being rate limiting. So I'm going to consider how fast does this corrosion process happen, given that the all of the chemical Gibbs energy change of the process of the metal dissolving and hydrogen being discharged, all of this is turned into uh, driving force for corrosion. So I'm not draining any energy from this system, making it work as a battery. I'm considering zero energy lost by heat generation as ion resistance in the solution, and zero energy drawn by electronic resistance. I'm only considering uh, what voltage uh, produced from my Gibbs energy change, what voltage is uh, lost because of the anode process itself, and that's the metal dissolving, and the cathode process itself. So this, uh, I'm assuming in this equation 3.8, I'm assuming this E cell is zero, I'm not drawing any useful power, and uh, two of the obvious losses, the ion resistance terms, uh, also any possible electronic resistance terms and a possible diffusion layer resistance terms, all of those have zero loss. And if all of those have zero loss, uh, then I have only 
essentially one thing to consider per electrode to work out how fast this reaction happens. Section 3.5 is a theory section deriving the Tafel equation. This equation is the model you will use to predict corrosion speed when there is only one limiting factor, that is electrode activation is the only limiting factor affecting the rate of an electrochemical process. The Tafel equation is important to you, so you do need to learn that from the later part of this section. So its equations coming up are 3.17 and 3.20. But if you don't want to learn the uh, justification, the theory which leads to the Tafel equation, then it's not really as important as understanding as being able to use the Tafel equation itself. Nonetheless, I don't believe that anyone can be happy using an equation unless they have seen where it comes from. So, section 3.5, this is the picture which allows us to justify and derive the Tafel equation predicting the speed of an anode electrode process. And this theory is also applicable to a cathode electrode process. Let's consider the Tafel equation being derived to estimate the current density of an electrode reaction such as copper dissolving to copper 2 plus. Some assumptions we are going to make in this model are first, the reaction is slow, so there are negligible energy losses because of mass transport. So that means that the uh, overpotential eta, the polarization loss, eta due to diffusion and due to ion resistance, those are both zero. Uh, we, in fact, don't even need to realize those losses might be called polarizations. Second assumption, we are going to assume the surface of the metal is at some potential E. So the surface has reached a single uniform surface potential of E, as given in equation 3.10. Then this diagram below is called a distance model, uh, which is used in electrochemistry to explain where the Tafel equation comes from. The Gibbs energy of the complete electrode, the entire system, is plotted as along the x-axis we consider a metal atom being moved a distance delta x away from the bulk metal and into the solution, where eventually the atom becomes a fully dissolved uh, metal plus ion. The uh, net rate of this, uh, say, copper to copper 2 plus reaction is obtained by adding up as we said, the simultaneous forward and reverse processes which actually take place. The forward and reverse processes are both described as Arrhenius limited processes, which take place with an attempt rate A, that's A forward and A backward, and some activation energy delta G star for the forward and the backward process respectively. Now looking at the diagrams, in the left-hand diagram A, we're looking at the case when the polarization is zero, in which case that means that's the same as saying there's no Gibbs energy change between the metallic state and the dissolved ion. Uh, but there is some energy barrier between them when the metal atom has been moved a small distance into solution and it's neither stabilized by being in the bulk metal nor stabilized by being solvated. And this, uh, this energy increase uh, provides an energy barrier for the polarization is zero case, which we're calling a delta G dagger. And this is the same energy barrier going forwards and going backwards. Now, for this case of the polarization being zero, we can write down equation 3.13. We know that there is zero net rate of corrosion when the polarization is zero because there is zero net driving force. So we know that the uh, I forwards, the forwards process current density, is equal to the backwards current density. So we can learn that those two Arrhenius those Arrhenius modeled terms from equation 3.11 and 3.12 uh, must be equal to each other and equal to the exchange current density when the uh, forwards and backwards uh, activation energy is considered to have the same value. That is something which we will now use in order to see what happens when we have case B in the diagram when the polarization is positive. 
If the polarization eta is positive, that's the same as saying that the Gibbs energy of the system decreases by an amount Zf eta when the metal goes from the metal phase to the dissolved phase. Now, the effect of this in the picture is that because the there is a total energy drop Zf eta, it's no longer the case that the forwards and backwards energy barriers are the same. The forwards energy barrier becomes a bit smaller, and the reverse energy barrier becomes a bit bigger. Algebraically, we say that of the total energy drop Zf eta, the forwards energy barrier decreases by some fraction alpha of that, so that the forwards activation energy becomes the delta G dagger minus alpha lots of Zf eta. Often alpha is 0.5 in simple cases. And likewise, the reverse energy barrier is increased by some amount. If we put those uh, new energy barriers into the forwards and backwards reaction rates of equations 3.11 and 12, uh, then we get equation 3.14, which tells us that the net current density is now the forwards current density minus the amount of backwards current density. And if we put terms in and simplify using equation 3.13, we get an expression for the net current density of our copper to copper 2 plus electrode. This equation is 3.15. It's called the Butler-Volmer equation, and it involves the exchange current density, which came from equation 3.13, and it involves two exponential terms to do with activation energy. On page 30, diagram 3.5.1 is a plot showing the current density predicted by the Butler-Volmer equation, equation 3.15, for uh, a reaction with some typical parameters. So you can imagine this, maybe this is a reasonable description, at least in principle, of, of the copper to copper 2 plus dissolution reaction. So we have a plot on the x-axis, we consider different possible polarizations of the copper electrode, and then the net current density is plotted on the y-axis, and the thick bold curve uh, represents the uh, result of the complete equation. Equation 3.15, this is how much net dissolution of copper there is if the current density is positive, or how much net plating there is if the current density is negative. And this equation looks nice enough, but we can make it simpler, and we do want to make it simpler, because at the moment it's a, a cinch or hyperbolic sine curve, or it's got two exponential terms into it. It's more complicated than we want to have to deal with. So what we will do is we will work out how to simplify it, and we'll do that by spotting that equation 3.15, the forward process minus the reverse process, is an exponential growth minus an exponential decay. Therefore, when the polarization is at least slightly positive, if it's at least 50 millivolts positive or more, then really the only significant term is the forward term. So, in other words, we say for moderately significant positive polarizations, the complete equation, the thick blue curve, is approximately well described by just the forward process, the dashed red line. So we can simplify from a sum of two exponentials to just the forward exponential. Likewise, for uh, large or moderately large negative polarizations, more negative than 50 millivolt minus 50 millivolts, the forward process minus the backward process is dominated by the much stronger backward process, just the uh, negative exponential. And in that case, we only take the, the backward uh, exponential term, and this gives us again an, an, equi an equally good approximation of the total equation. So this is very good, because it means we can produce, in section 3.5.2, the Tafel equation. So we say uh, our Tafel equation is not going to be a good description of electrodes which are very close to their equilibrium potential, but since, in reality, most interesting electrode reactions are at least 50 millivolts away from their equilibrium potential, we can use this approximation, and we'll say we'll just take the, relative, the relevant forward or reverse process. 
So in uh, equations 3.16 to 18, uh, we consider what if we have uh, corrosion, anodic polarization going on. If I've identified that I do have this going on, then I say only my uh, dissolution of metal, my forward process, is significant. So I say in equation 3.16, the net current density on the metal surface is just the forward current density, and it's this single um, term which has a exchange current density times by an exponential term with something to do with the polarization in the exponential. So this simplifies to the form equation 3.17a by grouping the relevant parameters together uh, so that we have current density equal to exchange current density times 10 to the power of polarization over beta a, where beta a is the Tafel slope. You get it by grouping together the constants in the exponential argument of 3.16, and you say the anode Tafel slope is this uh, expression, this quantity beta a given by equation 3.18, and if you uh, I'll look up the anode Tafel slope, or if you evaluate it, if you're given the fundamental parameters, uh, then you get the beta a term, and you can put it into the Tafel equation to predict what is the current density affecting the metal surface. I can get that as equation 3.17a, the Tafel equation, or I could rearrange it, and I could say that the polarization, the anodic polarization, is this Tafel slope beta a times by this log base 10 of the current of the actual current over the exchange current uh, densities. Okay. Likewise, uh, the Tafel equation for the cathodic process, or just the reduction process, uh, if I have a polarization more significantly negative than minus 50 millivolts, uh, then I say in equation 3.19 my net current density is approximately equal to just the uh, reverse process. It's cathodic, so I say it's a negative quantity. And I pull out equivalent terms so that in equation 3.20a, the Tafel equation for a cathode, I say my net current density is a negative amount, and it's the exchange current density times by 10 raised to the power of polarization over beta cathode, where beta cathode, the uh, cathode Tafel slope, is given by equation 3.21. Uh, but often um, we will simply be given the Tafel slopes, and they will be measured to be uh, some quantity, typically 100 millivolts, or we say they might be 100 millivolts per decade. Uh, the anode Tafel slope would be written down then as plus 100 millivolts per decade. The cathode Tafel slope might be written down as minus 100 millivolts per decade. Uh, the per decade reminds us that we're putting it into a expression where we have 10 to the power of something. Okay. Uh, what else do we need to know? Um, in the final case, if the polarization is quite small, if it's uh, close to zero and the, its absolute value is smaller than 50 millivolts, then the Tafel equation can't be applied. So that will not uh, come up in practice in most of the questions we look at, uh, but in that case we would need to use the complete form of equation 3.15. Usually, in applied calculations, we'll be using uh, the simplified form, the Tafel equation of 3.17 or equation 3.20, and we'll be using them uh, to predict speed of a corrosion process. That, so far, was the derivation of the Tafel equation. Now, on page 32, much more importantly, is the demonstration of how to use the Tafel equation uh, to predict a speed of corrosion in this case, for a simple two-electrode system, uh, with it says no mass transport limitation and unit activities. So this is a simple, slightly simpler corrosion problem than you will be given, uh, but you will very likely have to deal with this sort of problem, uh, because this problem, uh, this is the very centerpiece of the corrosion course. In order to make this calculation, you need to uh, understand the thermodynamics and kinetics so far, and once you use this equation, you will obtain a, a speed of corrosion, which is the starting point, the building block for understanding in practice what corrosion phenomena uh, we might see. So all of the course so far leads to this example, and the rest of the course leads away from this example. Uh, the problem is this. So it is, says, uh, determine the corrosion current density of an iron object dissolving in deaerated acid at pH 0, containing one molar Fe2 plus ions. So unit activities. 
Uh, assume the anode reaction is Fe iron metal goes to Fe2 plus plus two electrons, and the only cathode reaction is two protons or two hydrogen ions plus two electrons goes to a, a H2 uh, hydrogen gas molecule. Assume there is no mass transport limitation, and the reason that we're only con we're considering hydrogen reaction only is because the acid is deaerated, so there's no oxygen to provide an additional oxidizing agent. And we get given some data, so generously in this uh, question we're given the equilibrium potentials E subscript zero for the two relevant reactions, the hydrogen reaction and the ion reaction. And uh, this is generous because normally we would be given the standard electrode potentials for those two processes. In this uh, example, however, because we have unit activities, uh, the uh, equilibrium potentials are the same as the standard electrode potentials. For each of the two processes, we also get given the exchange current density and the Tafel slope. And that's what we're looking for. Now, in order to solve uh, this, to answer this question, determine the corrosion current density, uh, we have to write down just a few things. So we say, on the metal, um, I know that I'm looking at steady state, so I'm going to say I have some surface potential E on the metal. And I'm also going to say uh, I have charge balance at steady state. So I'm saying that this is a a mixed corrosion process. I haven't been told anything about there being a net current driven onto the metal, so it must be the case that my electrons being released by the dissolving iron, that's the anodic current density, must be the same as uh, electrons being, must be the same amount as the current density being absorbed by the cathode process. So that means to solve this equation we say we're going to be equating uh, equations 3.17a and 3.20a, the Tafel equation for the anode process and the cathode process. And if we do that, uh, we get some extended algebra. So you should be able to solve, first of all in this you'd probably cancel out some terms and get the value of E. You'd find that the surface potential is minus 0.21 volts SAG. And then, knowing the potential, you can plug that into either one of the Tafel equations, and you can say that the anode current density for the iron dissolving, or equivalently the cathode current density for the, um, for the hydrogen reacting. Um, if we consider just the absolute value of those, those are equal. Uh, they're equal to the corrosion current density, which in this example comes out as 0 0.066 milliamps per centimeter squared, using the terms given. So that's how you would solve the problem algebraically. And then you could use the Faraday relation on that, um, and you could say, this quantity, it's my 0.66 amps per meter squared. Uh, looking back to section, uh, early in section 3, example 3.2.1, uh, you could see how this current density relates to a speed of corrosion. You would say it's 0.77 millimeters per year. So, um, moderately, moderately fast corrosion going on there. That's how you would solve the Tafel equation algebraically. Um, and how else can you solve it? So alternatively, you could solve it geometrically. So the graph at the bottom of this page uh, shows you the, the what's called an Evans diagram on which you could plot the Tafel equation as a graphical construction. This is equivalent to doing the algebra. So the Evans diagram has log of current density along the x-axis and potential in volts uh, against SAG on the y-axis. And to construct this diagram, uh, you would first of all say we're assuming that the current densities of those processes, so the, the thin red line represents the true equation 3.15 Butler-Volmer equation telling us the net current density of the iron reaction, uh, but we're not going to plot that, we're going to plot the thick black line which is the approxim the Tafel approximation for that and likewise we'll plot the thick dashed blue line which is the Tafel approximation for the hydrogen reaction and we are looking for the intersection of these two lines that's where is the anode current density equal to the cathode current density um, at what single surface potential is that condition satisfied so I have to draw on my two lines so I draw the black line by putting a point at the start for the uh, exchange current density uh, 10 to the minus 5 milliamps per centimeter squared for iron and I do that at the 
equilibrium potential for the iron, so minus 0.44 volts SHE. That's the thick black line. I draw, the, draw in the thick black line using its Tafel slope. Likewise, I do the same for the uh, Tafel line for the hydrogen reaction. So I say that it's uh, it starts at a point somewhere, which is the exchange current density that's 10 to the minus 3 milliamps per centimeter squared, and an equilibrium potential of zero volts. And I uh, draw in a line with a suitable gradient for its Tafel slope, which is uh, given as uh, minus 0.118 volts per decade. And then I see where do those intercept, and that intersect intercept is the solution. So that's the minus 0.2 something uh, volts SHE as the as the surface potential, and some 0.066 uh, milliamps per centimeter squared as a as the as the corrosion current density. So I could solve the Tafel equations uh, for this case geometrically. In practice, most people these days solve algebraically because we have calculators, and algebraic manipulation is often a lot more straightforward to us now than plotting a graph. But plotting the graph is actually equivalent to solving this. Okay, so one more thing. So importantly, how would this problem change if in the example question I had not a one molar Fe2 plus concentration in the solution, but 0 0.01 molar, so 10 millimolar Fe2 plus. So the answer is that uh, we would only adjust this slightly. We would need to, before we start, we need to calculate the actual equilibrium potential of the ion electrode. Uh, so we're uh, we need to know the temperature. Uh, we might be given the temperature in this case is 298 kelvins, and we would plug that into the Nernst equation to work out what the equilibrium potential of the ion reaction is at the real concentration of dissolved Fe2 plus ions. And once we have that equilibrium potential, then we would plug that into the Tafel equation uh, and solve exactly in the same way by saying that the anode current density is equal to the cathode current density and we'd solve, and if we did that graphically, we'd find out that the corrosion potential is a bit more negative, and <coughs> the uh, corrosion current density is a bit more positive. <coughs> so, if you'll pardon my coughing, that brings an end to this lecture on corrosion kinetics, and we've got so far to the point where we can calculate the speed of a simple two-electrode corrosion process. Uh, next time we will look at some more complex corrosion processes. What if the kinetics are not only controlled by the Tafel equation, but also maybe uh, mass transport limited? What if the oxidizing agent is dissolved oxygen and it's too dilute to support this uh, such a fast corrosion rate as might be predicted by this equation. So we will do that in the future.